welcome back to our guided holiday with Trafalgar across the northwest region of France. We are currently in the heart of the Loire Valley, a UNESCO-listed World Heritage Site known for its lush landscape, world-famous vineyards, quaint townscapes, and some of the most magnificent chateaux in France. The valley takes its name from the Loire River that splits France into north and south. The natural beauty, bountiful land, rich hunting grounds and generally good climate attracted French royals and nobles who built their homes in the valley. The Loire was, at least during the Renaissance, the it address in France. The most beautiful chateau in France can be found here in the Loire Valley, but there's a downside to that. Because of their popularity and their beauty, they can get really crowded during peak season. What you want is a chateau, a castle, a home all to yourself, a chateau like this one. Chateau de Porcé is a home of one of the last remaining nobles in France, Count Rémy de Civiteau, Welcome select guests to his manor amidst a sprawling farm outside Le Mans. And today, he's opened his home to our group. It's part of Trafalgar's Be My Guest program, where guests get a chance to experience a destination like a local would, amongst locals. In the Loire, that means enjoying the sophisticated lifestyle of a French aristocrat, with an intimate tour of an authentic Renaissance chateau with a count himself, and a lavish lunch prepared by his family, a feast featuring the best produce from the valley. To enjoy fine food, especially the cheese and wine, is one of the top reasons to visit Loire, and much of what's served to us was sourced from farms around the chateau. It's not often that we get to meet French nobility. Those who weren't beheaded during the French Revolution had to escape to other parts of Europe, the Count's family was lucky the mob never reached this part of the valley. The Chateau also survived the German invasion of World War II. The Wehrmacht took over the property and made it their headquarters here. Though the Chateau has been properly restored since. All this is, is authentic, right? I mean, you, you come into a lot of chateau and uh, things are not the original anymore. It's, it's built, it, it's, it's decorated to please the tourists. Yes. We didn't have many change here. And my uh, grandparents was uh, very loving uh, art and they added some oriental things here. And uh, we have uh, many decoration, also Islamic decoration, Asiatic decoration, and a lot of jewels of the 17th and 18th century, a lot of painting. All the portraits in the living room are my ancestors. It's hard to believe, but as far as Loire chateaus go, this manor is considered quaint and humble. But it's elegant nevertheless, and a great way to meet and get a peek into the lifestyle of a local aristocrat. Now, if this is where a minor noble once lived, just imagine what a chateau of French kings and queens looked like. That's where we're headed next. For defensive and purely aesthetic reasons, royals preferred to build their castles along the river, and Chateau d'Amboise, on a hill above the Loire, is considered the most historically significant. Amboise was established as a seat of French royalty in the 15th century, and a tour of the castle is like a visual lesson in French Renaissance history. Most people who come to Amboise go directly to the castle or to the town around it. They don't realize there's a hidden treasure right across the Loire River. It's a statue of one of the greatest men who lived here, the statue of Leonardo da Vinci, and he's right here. The statue overlooks the castle, the Italian Renaissance genius helped design. Da Vinci was invited by King Francois I to live in Amboise, and Leonardo's legacy, along with other Italian Renaissance artists, looms large over the chateau and the town around it. What is the influence of the Italians? You have the likes of Da Vinci here. You have yes. some of the architecture reminds you of, of uh, buildings you see in Florence. Yes. What, what, what was the role of the Italians? 
because the French troops decided to launch campaign in Italy to conquer Italy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the French troops fall in love really with the culture, uh, Italian culture, and they decided to attract Italian artists to mix their culture, their old culture, with this Quattrocento style, mm -hmm. and that's the reason of this. Uh, very uh, specific building mixing French culture and Italian culture. It is the first French Renaissance style. You could say Amboise was ground zero of the French Renaissance. The original castle was a typical medieval defensive fortress, but the French king employed Italian architects, gardeners and artisans to transform the chateau into a grand Renaissance palace. Parts of the castle are open to visitors, and the rooms, recreated to reflect the regal lives and lifestyles of the royals and famous residents that once lived here, are definitely worth a visit. The Tour de Menim, the chateau's main tower, was once used to spot advancing armies and defend the castle. Today, it provides spectacular panoramic views of the Loire River and surrounding valley. The tower houses a massive spiral ramp which horse-mounted soldiers could use to get up and down quickly. Wow, this is really cool. I've been to the Amboise Castle a couple of years ago, but I never knew you could go through this gate. It's a special arrangement just for us. But let's see what's over there. The restricted area, comprised of a network of abandoned tunnels, is only open through special appointment. But our Trafalgar travel director decided to surprise us with a picnic and some bubbly at the end of it. Somewhere in this castle, well at least according to legend, is a passageway that leads to Clos Luce, which is the manor house of Leonardo da Vinci. Now, it's never been historically ascertained, but it's a good story. And according to that story, the French king would use that passageway to visit da Vinci who eventually became his friend and advisor. Maybe I'll discover it in this visit. Nope, not here. Close Lucet, a short walk across town, was Da Vinci's residence in Amboise, and where he also passed away. The local hero was later buried at the neo-Gothic Chapelle Saint-Hubert on the grounds of the castle, Leonardo's final resting place. The French monarchy eventually packed up and moved back to Paris in the 17th century, but not before making the most of their jolly good time in the many pleasure palaces they built in the Loire Valley. She's lovely, isn't she? And in my opinion, Chenonceau is the most beautiful chateau in the entire Loire Valley. But you know what? These chateaux weren't always so lovely. In fact, during the Middle Ages, these were castles, defensive fortresses. But when siege warfare became obsolete, the kings and queens of France could now concentrate on building this really beautiful and marvelous chateau like Chenonceau. The journey into what is known as Europe's most lovely castle begins with a bit of suspense, a walk through a magnificent avenue bordered by plane trees and picturesque streams. Many prefer to prolong the suspense with a stroll through the vegetable patches and the rose bushes of the flower garden just before the entrance. Nothing quite prepares you for the beauty you come across inside, the lovely, turreted chateau with its gallery, built over a series of arches over the river Cher, seems like, as a poet Flaubert put it, floating on water and air. The scene is magical, a castle fit for a Disney princess, or in the case of France, a jealous queen and a royal mistress. If Amboise Castle, where we just came from, is considered to be a masculine structure, a king's castle, Chenonceau, is known more as a lady chateau. And indeed, there's an interesting backstory about two women associated with this chateau. The king's wife, Catherine de Medici, and his mistress, a certain Diane of Poitiers. 
and that rivalry plays out in this place. Both women left their mark on Chenonceau. King Henry II offered it to Diane, but after his death, his queen, Catherine de' Medici, took over the property and banished the mistress to a humbler chateau on the valley. In her time at Chenonceau, Diane had a formal garden attached to the castle and a bridge built over the river. Not to be outdone, Queen Catherine added a more lavish Italianate garden and built a gallery over the bridge built by her rival. If you're really into this story of romance and vengeance, an included tour of the palace's rooms reveals more details of the royal rivalry. Like the initials of Henry and Catherine on the walls of the bedroom, secretly interlaced to form the letter D, D for Diane. And the painting of the goddess Diana in the bedchamber, a reminder to all of the original lady of the palace. We owe the feminine beauty of Chenon So to the noble and wealthy heiresses who made the palace their home after Catherine and Diane. The property is currently in the hands of the chocolate magnate, the Meunier family, who spent lavishly to restore Chenon So to its original glory. So much so that visitors today, commoners like myself, can enjoy a slice of the royal lifestyle and get a taste of what it was like to live at the height of the French Renaissance in the Loire Valley. Join us again next time as we continue our guided holiday across northwest France, through the coast of Normandy, and back to Gay Patty. And that's all for this episode of Executive Class. Join us again next time for part two. Till then, I'm David Saldran. Thanks for watching.